and welcome to the 25th, sorry, 26th meeting of the Economy, <coughs> Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2018. Um, first of all, uh, may I remind everyone to turn their electrical devices to silent or off if they might interfere with proceedings. And um, uh, the first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items 3, 4 and 5 in private. Are we all agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. And we now move on to our pre-budget scrutiny. And uh, first of all, we have from Highlands and Islands Enterprise, uh, Nick Kenton, Director of Finance and Corporate Services, Charlotte Wright, Chief Executive, and Carl Buxton, uh, Director of Regional Development. So welcome to all three of you this morning. And we'll move straight into questions, and we'll start off with one from Committee member Jamie Halko Johnson. Thank you very much, Convener. Welcome to the panel. Um, I want to know, uh, I've got a cu couple of questions, or a number of questions. One, some will focus on broadband, but to start off with, I'd like to know um, how the reduction in budget over the recent years has impacted on Highlands and Islands Enterprises' work uh, and also your ability to provide, maintain, and safeguard employment. I think if. Uh, I could uh, stop uh, just to uh, talk about the, the budget. Um, our budget has, has actually remained fairly stable over the last uh, three or four financial years, reduced slightly in 2016-17 um, as a result of the spending review. It went back up again in 2017-18 and we benefited uh, from, from some in-year capital additions in 2017-18. And for 2018-19, the resource budget has gone up slightly. Capital budget is, has um, stayed the same in terms of... Um, baseline, um, although it's lower than last year because we had benefit of some increases in year last year. So the budget has been relatively stable in cash terms, but of course that does translate to a, 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 a slight uh, reduction in terms of spending power. So just on the, on the second part of your question in relation to uh, supporting jobs, uh, over the last year, 17, 18, in fact, we dedicated more of our resources directly to support to companies uh, in pursuit of creating sustainable employment. Okay, thank you very much. And um, just a kind of general point, if you were analysing... Uh, you know, kind of performance and, and against kind of targets. How many jobs have been created by uh, your account managed companies over the past year, uh, and how much you feel you can attribute this to your work and your interventions? Jobs created um, that we counted against our uh, performance measures for 1718 was 981. So the majority of those uh, jobs created do come through our account managed portfolio. We do uh, give support to non-account uh, managed companies also, dependent on the, the nature of the project or also in some of our broader programmes such as internationalising and innovation. So the way that we count those jobs is that we only measure those that are created through our support. So we have a process to be able to do that. So uh, an expansion project uh, by a company may create, say, 100 jobs, but we will examine through um, an approach that we have of looking at what we call the base case, what would have happened without our intervention, and then what has happened with our intervention, so that we can attribute the amount of job growth specifically to the intervention that we have made. If it's helpful, we can provide you more detail on how we actually do that. That would be interesting. And what would your target have been? You did 981 jobs for last year. What would, would the target have been, or do you have a target for jobs? Job yes, growth. we do. Sorry, yeah. we have a, a target range, and I think last year it was between 800, 800 to about, um, I think it was maybe 1,200, but it was about mid-range. Yes, yeah, so o over the last uh, five years we have uh, met all of our job creation targets. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I'm sure um, other colleagues will pick up more on that. But uh, one of the areas that I wanted to ask as a Highlands Islands MSP was around broadband. Um, one of the areas that seemed to have been cut, had quite major cuts to it, was uh, around eight million on the investment in broadband. And I was just wondering why that budget's been prioritised prioritized in that way. And uh, given the kind of region remains so uh, kind of dependent on good quality broadband, how, how that decision was made. Okay, so is that with regard to the um, the broadband programme that uh, Highlands and Islands led uh, with support from the Scottish Government and UK Government. I yeah. don't think the budget was cut for that. I, I think the, well, s the spend has been lower. 
um, than the the forecast spend, but the delivery has been as as we said in the contract. We've actually delivered all the contractual targets have been met, but with a lower level of spend. We are continuing to spend beyond the original period of the contract, both through um, making use of the underspend, you know, things that have been delivered more cheaply, we've been reinvesting in, in further rollout, um, and also through clawback via the take-up. The original take-up was targeted at about 30%. Um, and we've been reaching over 40% of take, uh, take up, which pay, uh, stage BT reimburse money into the contract. So although the spend is a bit lower, the actual contract has delivered for, it's be delivered more with less money, to be honest. But, but that, that money would still be there then to spend, it just hasn't well, been spent now. Um, it, it is still there. I think the intention is to roll it into R100 so it'll be delivered through the next procurement because otherwise the current um, contract would, would continue on. We're looking to finish build under the current programme in December next year, um, by which time the R100 programme should have, uh, procurement should have completed and we'll be able to roll out the future contract. Okay, so you're confident that you're meeting the requirements uh, given to you, basically to deliver these, deliver the broadband well, rider. Certainly, under our current current contract with BT, we have delivered um, our contractual targets, which was originally 84% of premises across the region, um, and at a local authority level, we had set a minimum of 75% coverage in each local authority area, with the exception at the beginning of the contract of the Western Isles, where we felt that was going to be extremely challenging to meet, and we set a target of 70%. In reality, we've actually achieved, I think it's 78% coverage in the, in the Western Isles, and we've, our highest local authority is Murray at 92% coverage. So yes, we have reached all those contractual targets. Um, the R100 programme, which is currently out to procurement, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything getting away from the fact that it is the most challenging bits that are left to cover now. So, you know, there's still a big job to do. Very quickly, two, 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 two questions. And how, how do you evaluate the work that BT Openreach does um, on, in terms of the rollout? How do you how do you check that and uh, compare to, to the money that goes in? Well, we use, we use some independent checkers. There's a number of um, independent organisations that check who, what the take-up is, what speeds they can achieve, and we're getting consistently good results on that against the, the contractual targets. I think um, as, as we move to the R100, which is, as I say, more challenging targets, and it is 100% coverage, um, that, well, there is a big job to be done. Can I just quote you very, very quickly, then, um, the... Uh, Superfast Broadband for Scotland report, which came out, which you'll be aware, at, aware of. And in the summary, Community Broadband Scotland did not deliver the anticipated benefits for rural community broadband projects. A review of CBS's role found that lack of specialist skills, poor communications, and complex tendering requirements contributed to lengthy delays and failed procurements. Community groups told us that this has affected their confidence in the ability of Scottish Government and HIE to deliver broadband to rural communities. Um, how would you respond to that? As, as you might anticipate, we would we would challenge some of that. I think um, CBS had an incredibly difficult job to do. I think quite a lot of the um, evidence that came out in the report or the findings of that support did did sort of underscore the difficulties in the smaller um, broadband delivery market. A lot of the procurements, there was not a lot of interest from actually broadband providers in, de in delivering the projects. I think we're all aware of some of the bigger projects which faced very big challenges in terms of sustainability. We always looked when we were looking at the product, projects with community that they did have a sustainable future. That was very, very difficult in some cases. So I think, it again, yes, it was challenging. Um, we did decide that there were maybe better ways to deliver it moving forward. And I think as, as the new programme comes, we're looking at aligned interventions and how we might deliver those. But it is a huge ask of communities to take these projects on. So we're looking at new ways rather than the existing model of rolling out broadband kind of going forward, particularly to those more remote rural areas, I think as in the Highlands and Islands. I think we have to be open to other ways. I think the R100 programme is looking to go as far as it is humanly possible with fibre, but I think in some areas there may have to be alternative solutions, but not necessarily delivered by communities, delivered in a in a different way. I, th I think it's maybe worth highlighting that you know we try to do an innovative approach, and in doing innovative approaches, sometimes things don't work out as you would want them to. What we found was it was in incredibly complex. 
Um, you can imagine the reception in a community hall when you start off with the words procurement and state aid. That is not uh, something that uh, communities really want to uh, hear from us, or nor does it sound like we're trying to be helpful when indeed we are, but as you all know, they are actually some of the realities that these types of projects need to deal with. So I think what we get from that is a whole set of lessons learned, which we can apply working with Scottish Government to the R100 uh, project and looking at, as Carol said, the aligned interventions. We are acutely conscious that those last hard to reach places in the main are still parts of the Highlands and Islands. And we absolutely agree it's imperative that they get access to proper broadband and also mobile coverage too. Thank you very much. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, um, convener. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about, you said in response to um, a question just there about the jobs you've created, about how you assess the baseline of what would have happened without your intervention. Can you say a little bit more about how you do that? So working with, uh, for example, an account managed company, we would look at a, a growth plan with them for uh, investment and other types of support. Uh, and in doing that, we will work through their set of projections and numbers and determine uh, what their trajectory would be without our support and then what it, difference our own support will make in terms of scale or timing or both, uh, and also particularly where that impacts on job numbers. So that, and, and again, we can send that detail if you'd like to see that. Uh, it worked through with some examples, which would probably be helpful, so that we have that base case of uh, a project may well still happen without our intervention, but with our intervention, it either happens more quickly or at scale. And we can also be clear that there's a direct attribution between the support that we make and the jobs that we are claiming through um, our performance measures. So we won't claim the whole set of jobs that might be created through a project, but those that we can attribute to our intervention to that project. And in some cases, that might be quite specific. So a project might have a, n a number of elements, some of which we deem don't need our support. And we'll maybe focus on the elements, say, that look at uh, productivity or um, expanding internationalization or bringing automation or improvements to productivity into a project. So again, if, if that's helpful, we could perhaps give you one or two worked examples so that you could see that. That, that would be helpful, I think, because um, we have an interest on an ongoing basis in making sure that we're spending public money effectively. That would be that would be useful. In your annual report, you say that you've had six inward investors to the region. Um, presumably one of these is Liberty and Fort William. What are the other five? Uh, so uh, Liberty is actually from a previous year. Um, well, previous year, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'll see if I can remember them off the top of my head, and perhaps some of my colleagues can uh, look for them while I'm working. So there is... Um, uh, Op Capita in Murray, who uh, a software development company. Um, Aseptium, was that one? I think Aseptium, Aseptium uh, who are in Inverness, who do uh, decontamination of um, uh, equipment for hospital services. Uh, sorry, I just need to look up the rest of the, the list. They've gone out of my head. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a test. I'm just. Um, <laughs> and these are these are relatively. Small companies, yes, 40, 50 employees? Yes, yes so. they are relatively small. And um, so to take the example, say, of Aseptium in Inverness, who are based on the Inverness campus, that they have been uh, targeted through the focus that we have for the development of the campus. So we put £25 million into the development of the campus to create the infrastructure and conditions uh, for inward investment, particularly in um, a, a niche sector of life sciences around uh, medical diagnostics and technology. A septium exactly fits that brief. One of the strengths that we've been able to market for the Inverness uh, campus development is the partnership that we have, particularly with the uh, NHS, who uh, are based just across the road, and indeed uh, the next phase of our development includes a um, acute uh, care centre, which will take place on the campus, which creates not only a facility for patients, but also for research and development. So the principle around that is bringing onto site companies who can derive benefits from working through the partnerships and key assets that we have to offer there. And the Liberty in Fort William, you, you talk about hundreds of new jobs. Are some of those hundreds included in the 981 for last uh, no, year? No, no, they're not for that year. I think I'm right in saying. No, they're not because um, the, the 
well, the project in Liberty is at a relatively early stage. So in terms of when we, uh, if we um, put direct for financial assistance, that, that's at the only stage that we'll claim any jobs. Liberty at the moment, I think, are forecasting around about 400. Yeah, yeah still to be uh, determined. So um, um, uh, our work has been very close with the Scottish Government and um, other agencies, particularly Highland Council and others. And actually what we see our role at the moment is facilitating everything that needs to happen round about the Liberty development to make that work. So in particular, as it happens, I live in Fort William, so I'm very close to that, that um, there are challenges in terms of getting those skills, getting those people, and actually providing uh, housing. So the, the real challenge for delivering the Liberty project is actually around uh, attracting uh, the skills base to Fort William without having a detrimental impact on other key businesses in the area who are already facing some skills challenges. And when you look at inward in in investors, obviously inward investors can be from abroad, they could be from the rest of the UK. Um, what assessment do you make as to the likelihood that if you were not to support them that they would go somewhere else, either in Scotland or the UK? Uh, yes, so that is an important aspect of what we would look at uh, in uh, attracting inward investment. So it's important nationally that we're attracting that uh, inward investment to Scotland, and that's the, the key consideration for us and our colleagues in Scottish Enterprise will be landing that project for Scotland uh, and often determining what, what we have can make uh, a more attractive proposition in Scotland is based around what assets we have. So they might be about our ac academic base in universities, uh, skills, or indeed actually the sort of natural capital around it. I mean, Liberty is an obvious example of having made an investment in what is now the UK's only aluminium smelter uh, to not only to sustain that development, but to take it into um, uh, added value manufacturing process, which indeed uh, helps the UK's uh, car manufacturing sector potentially post-Brexit by securitising their supply chain, by developing um, a part of a supply chain which currently doesn't exist in the UK. So I suppose as a case study, that has a number of those key elements. Okay, thank you. And Angela Constance. Uh, Convener. Um, my first few questions are principally to uh, Scottish Enterprise. Um, Scottish Enterprise in 2017-18 spent uh, just over £19 million on, I quote, um, inclusive growth. Uh, now that's equivalent to 8% of its total operating expenditure. Uh, why only 8% uh, given that inclusive growth is meant to be front and centre um, of our country's economic strategy? So... Sorry, so should we leave those questions for Scottish Enterprise? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forgive me. Yeah. Perhaps okay, move I mean, on to some yeah, questions. I, I, I won't, I won't, an I won't, inadvertent I, slip. I, I won't ask about regional uh, uh, selective uh, ass assistance then. Um, uh, I wonder if you could tell me um, how many... Um, uh, Highlands and Islands enterprise account managed companies uh, are led by women. Yes, I have that information in my pack, if you bear with me. You do, if you can find yeah. it. Just I'll, I'll, I'll maybe waffle while Charlotte finds the, pic the figures. We have actually, we've done some analysis recently about the, the number of percentage of women that not only um, run our account managed businesses and social enterprises, but also participate in our programmes, and the levels are increasing on a on a yearly basis and around about, in most, most respects, at the halfway mark now. I think in terms of leading and managing um, businesses and, account, uh, and social enterprises, we have much my, m higher figures of women leading at CEO level, for example, social enterprises rather than businesses. But um, I'm looking at my colleagues now to see if they've found the, <laughs> found the, you have the detailed to, figures. within the programme stuff, I think. Okay. Apologies, this is... Uh, there's, there's so many things that it's... Uh, uh, apologies for uh, our delay in getting that, sorry. So, uh, female uh, ownership of our account managed business is 33% on the business, uh, business side. Um, we also have a split for our social enterprises as well. Uh, the amount of account managed businesses who have a female chief executive is only 14%, so recognise that is a low number. 
interestingly, it is much higher uh, amongst social enterprises at uh, 45%. So you see the difference there between uh, business and social enterprise, which I think poses some interesting questions about is there something within the um, flexibility of working within a social enterprise that perhaps is more attractive or um, works better for women. So that's something that we actually want to, to look into. Uh, I can also give you some numbers on uh, the senior leadership positions within those organisations as well. And that looks at slightly better gender split at 48% of uh, senior leadership positions in business are led by women. And again, that is higher for social enterprises at 64%. So that is something that we have been tracking. We do have quite a lot of data that uh, sits beneath that as well. So I'm, I'm very aware of the success that social enterprise has um, in uh, women's representation at a, a senior level. And I'm also aware that the Highlands and Islands uh, punches well above its weight in terms of the proportion um, of social enterprises uh, in that part of, of the country. But I wonder if you could say um, a bit more specifically about some of the programmes um, in terms of how you will support uh, the advancement of uh, senior uh, female leadership um, in companies that are not social enterprises but actually in key sectors uh, and key growth sectors of the, the Highlands and Islands economy. Yeah, so there's, there's a number of things uh, that we're doing across the board, including uh, working with uh, other partners such as uh, Investing Women. So we've done uh, a number of events with in Investing Women uh, both looking at both sides of the equation there, both getting women as investors and also investing in women-led uh, businesses. Uh, we've worked with Women's Enterprise Scotland and actually they have uh, delivered our, for us a training course for our account managers so that uh, to improve their awareness of some of those gender specific issues for businesses overall. Uh, we're also running uh, a, a couple of um, European projects which have a focus on that gender balance. So um, a Northern Periphery project looking at the Arctic area as partners is looking at challenges um, experienced by women starting up businesses in rural and sparsely populated areas. So obviously that's uh, a very strong connection for the Highlands and Islands and working with partners and countries in that sort of uh, Arctic area, Finland, uh, Sweden um, and Ireland as well, particularly who have that uh, predominance of rural and sparsely populated areas overall. Uh, we do also track um, the take-up by women of our uh, programmes which support businesses overall um, and looking at the gender split of take up of those programmes is quite interesting. So we have a number around management and leadership which are pretty well balanced between male and female take up. The ones that stand out for me um, particularly are around mentoring and also use of accelerators. So mentoring find that these, uh, only 35% of those taking up uh, mentoring are women. Again, this poses some interesting questions, and um, I was at a, a think tank uh, that Women's Enterprise Scotland uh, organised last month. In fact, they had uh, two parallel events, one all women and one all men, and we're awaiting the report of that. But the all women event actually had a real focus on the importance of mentoring. So um, looking back at those figures, it's interesting that there's, there still seems to be some inbuilt challenge to women <coughs> taking up mentoring as part of the support overall um, and on in terms of use of accelerators growth accelerators we found the greatest traction uh, for women involved in those accelerator programs was when we ran a virtual accelerator with entrepreneurial uh, spark so that it wasn't the requirement that you often get to be in a certain location for a certain amount of hours, but was more flexible. So that both met uh, our requirement of reaching some of our more rural areas, as well as clearly uh, developing some of the flexibility that women entrepreneurs are obviously looking for. So we do have a bit of um, detail behind some of that data again, if it's helpful to share some of that. Uh, yeah, and it, it's certainly important to um, not make any assumptions about the um, programmes that are likely or not likely to um, appeal to, to, to women. And I think some of your figures are uh, quite, quite. there is a quite a stark variation between 71% of women on the Entrepreneurial Spark virtual pilot and 35% uh, of women. Um, you also have been doing some work in terms of childcare 
pilots. Um, I just wondered, is that for preschool children or is it children of all ages? Uh, I don't know to be sure. I'm, I'm fairly certain it's for children of all ages. Um, and again, that was really based on, on some of the work that we'd done about, around about occupational segregation and the reasons why, why women weren't taking up opportunities. And that did t um, tend to, to revolve around caring responsibilities, particularly childcare. So we've done a couple of things. We've got one pilot, um, I think it's over in the, in the Western Isles, where we're looking at a social enterprise model for childcare. But certainly coming through from our research in, in terms of occupational segregation, childcare is a, a significant issue, along with other things like transport um, in our more rural areas, which are a barrier for women going into the the labour market. And okay. it is a sort of double hit because the, the development of the childcare facility it, itself creates um, you know, quite often a, a social enterprise opportunity and uh, for uh, work and employment as well as creating the conditions that would enable others to take up employment. And of course, there's a need to get more men into childcare as well. My final question for this panel, uh, convener, um, is following on from the uh, detailed explanation of um, what Highland and Islands Enterprise are doing to improve the gender balance uh, within uh, businesses in the various economy. Um, but there's also you know, a youth employment action plan, there's a fair work convention, there's a disability action plan uh, geared towards uh, reducing the, the disability employment gap. Um, there are many uh, organisations you know, working to improve the, the under-representations uh, of people from the BME community. I just wonder if you could speak about diversity uh, more broadly. Uh, yes, and, and conscious of uh, probably a need to do more in, in some of that area. Um, uh, it's probably fair to say it, it, in relation to the diversity of the Highlands and Islands itself that that uh, you know, perhaps creates some of the, the conditions that we see reflected uh, in our businesses overall. Um, I, I think, to be fair, there's probably some more work we need to do in relation to uh, disability. Uh, we're also taking forward, actually, as an employer ourselves, um, the opportunity to provide employment to care leavers. So we know that that is uh, sometimes a challenging area and feel that as an employer we should lead by example. So um, are looking at developing that as a case study ourselves and, and do find that actually by trialling some of those um, employment practices within our own organisation, we can uh, indeed practise what we preach. So... Um, as I say, there are probably some more work to do on some of those areas for us. I think in, in, in particular as well, the youth, youth agenda is quite important in our area. We do need to, you know, we do quite a lot of work in, in terms of talent attraction and um, trying to increase opportunities for young people. We've done some research both through our business panel and um, a specific piece of per, uh, research looking at the aspirations and attitudes of young people this year and looking at maybe some of the the, the, the tensions between what employers are looking at and what young people are looking at, some things they rank more important, like work-life balance in terms of looking um, for job opportunities. So we're looking at the, the outcomes of those, both those pieces of research and seeing what we can do both with our young population, um, who a very positive story coming through again, the, the numbers of young people in the region who want to stay and live and work in the, the region are increasing year on year, but looking at how we work with our, our businesses to ensure that they are offering the, the types of opportunities that young people are actually interested in and want to take up and that they understand what that looks like. One of the key things also that was coming through from the young people study is that they're not always necessarily looking for um, a, a job for life, they actually want the opportunity to move around and gain more experience until they, they decide what they want. So working on things like the graduate placement program, which you're offering people a, a 12 month to 18 month placement has proved very, very successful in both retaining young people in the area, not necessarily in the business where they've undertaken their, their, their placement, but maybe in another business within the Highlands and Islands region. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jackie Bailey. Um, thank you, convener. Could I ask you uh, about things that are perhaps missing in your report or indeed um, maybe not really given much attention? There is one small mention of the oil and gas industry. Now, at its height, I believe it led to about 10,000 jobs in, in the Highlands and Islands area, now at least about 1,500. Um, I'm curious to know why there isn't a mention of it. 
Um, I mean, I think it's still important in Shetland, in the Cromarty Firth. Um, I'd be curious to know what action you intend to take round about the oil and gas industry. Yeah, and I guess that was just a choice about uh, providing a flavour and overview of activity. So in no way to um, diminish both the importance past and present to oil and gas within the highlands and islands. And we have in invested considerably um, across the board. We have around 150 companies um, in account management who are in or provide services to the oil and gas sector. It is quite difficult to get a firm number and there are no official statistics of employment on a regional basis uh, in oil and gas, but uh, we have uh, very good connections uh, through employment agencies uh, and estimate the number of uh, offshore workers in, in key positions from the Highlands and Islands to be somewhere around 6,000. So it is pretty critical in terms of uh, its employment overall. Um, I, I think... There, there, there are some exceptions, and we did have one significant company who um, went into administration uh, last year based in, in Murray. But overall, the sector has proved quite resilient in the Highlands and Islands, and I think that's because it's been able to look at diversification during the oil and gas uh, downturn, including into renewables and other sectors of engineering overall and we supported quite a lot of uh, activity with those 150 companies in our account managed base in terms of innovation and uh, internationalization in particular as uh, a lot of that oil and gas service work um, is in high demand overseas uh, as you will know overall so uh, for 17 18 uh, we provided grant support to 17 companies totaling 2.6 million uh, we've also seen some successes through um, working with the Scottish Government with the uh, decommissioning funds. So that's funds that have gone into the dry dock at Kishorn, which is now drained and available for, for work and looks absolutely fantastic. And the development in Shetland of Dalesville for deep water decommissioning. And we have had the, um, what's it called, Alpha... Uh, forget the name of the platform that has in being uh, decommissioned at the moment. So a real example of that decommissioning taking place in Scotland in purpose-built facilities in Shetland and something indeed that we want to capitalise on overall. And of course, if you heard the news this morning, then uh, a lot of uh, potential further gas exploration west of Shetland. So Shetland remains very well set up for that and including the ports and harbours infrastructure in the Highlands and Islands again, which we've uh, invested in quite heavily in areas such as Scrabster, uh, standing ready to take advantage of those opportunities. So that kind of detail will be reflected in your operating plans going forward then? So we are um, just in the planning for our next uh, strategic plan. So we've had uh, strategic discussions both with our board and we also do an all-staff strategic session and we'll be taking a draft of our plan to the October High Board meeting. Uh, and yes, we'll look at that kind of uh, sectoral information. I guess it's not going to be detailed for every sector uh, for a strategic plan, but we do have a set of sector strategies which set behind that as well. Okay. Um, the other thing missing which I confess surprised me was Brexit. Um, perhaps you know something we don't know, but I'm assuming um, it's happening and it's happening in Highlands and Islands as well. Um, was that again you know, just a matter of detail or, or is this not the biggest single challenge facing our economy? Yeah, yes, absolutely, year. of course. Okay. And uh, that, uh, I mean, I think we did make some uh, reference to those sorts of challenges without specifically uh, using the Brexit word. But absolutely it is. And if you're asking me what I see as the biggest challenge for the Highlands and Islands, it is without a shadow of a doubt is the people equation. We already have significant challenges across all sectors in all parts of the Highlands and Islands uh, facing challenges, not only of skills, but actually of people. And I think perhaps there, the Highlands and Islands is in a slightly different position to the rest of Scotland in that the challenge 
uh, and talking to companies, uh, many would like the opportunity of getting people in and training them uh, and not seeing the skills acquisition as a difficulty, but actually the recruitment and retention challenges themselves being significant. So we undertake a business panel survey on an ongoing basis. We have a panel of uh, a thousand businesses for the Highlands Alliance, so that's a very significant proportion of the businesses, and it's also representative of the business base in the Highlands and Islands. And so we test that regularly in terms of uh, challenges and opportunities uh, around what might be happening. And we see that uh, around half are concerned about uh, skills challenges. Uh, that is even higher in sectors such as tourism and food and drink, which are very uh, heavily reliant on migrant workers. Uh, many are looking uh, at opportunities in terms of productivity investments to uh, improve their own resilience going forward. So the business panel itself gives us some very real and important live feedback from businesses about how they see the challenge day to day. And as I say, a lot of that focuses on get uh, the availability of talent and people to be able to actually respond to what is quite a considerable opportunity at the moment, particularly in those sectors that I mentioned. And tourism has enjoyed uh, a couple of bumper years. The Highlands and Islands has been exceptionally busy, uh, and we want to build on that opportunity. Food and drink businesses across the Highlands and Islands with, of course, stars in the sector like salmon and whiskey coming from the Highlands and Islands are also quite dependent on migrant workers. Uh, we've worked with the aquaculture sector, who again have evidenced uh, some of their concerns about being able to attract skills and talent into their sector. The planning for the future around Brexit, I guess, is more difficult for us, uh, and we are doing a set of uh, scenario planning around that. Uh, and at the moment, our focus is making sure that our, our businesses are resilient, and that we focus in opportunities. And a lot of that is about what uh, exporting might look like for the future, including exporting into uh, growth economies out with the EU. OK, one final very small question, convener. Obviously, HIE's um, operating includes community development and support for fragile communities. Um, it, we've seen you do that in the past. What challenges do you face in doing that in the future? but also how can you um, instill some of that knowledge to the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency? So uh, strengthening communities activity is and remains a core part of what Highlands and Islands does. We split our work into four priorities and strengthening communities is one of those key priority areas. Uh, and our board are absolutely supportive that we continue to give that focus to our uh, remote and rural communities. We uh, account manage uh, a set of communities in the way that we would account manage businesses. Um, clearly, uh, land reform and community ownership of land and assets has been key to what we have done in the Highlands and Islands. So there will be no change to our strategic view that working with communities and also uh, through our approach to inclusive growth to ensuring that prosperity reaches all parts of our Highlands and Islands. That, I recognise, is not without its challenges. And we see areas such as Argyll and the Western Isles who are actually losing population. And in some areas, that is giving us a, a great cause for concern. So whilst we do have some, some great numbers, as Carol quoted, in terms of what young people are saying and their commitment to their area, there are parts of um, the Western Isles, the US, that look particularly uh, fragile, given some of the population loss, and equally in parts of Argyll. So we're working with both the local authorities and those areas to see how we can focus our joint efforts uh, uh, even more to ensure that we create the resilience and sustainability of those communities. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Move on to John Mason now. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Just, I mean, just to follow up on that point from Jackie Bailey, is there a, a, a definition of fragile, or is it everywhere except Inverness, or how does that work? Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a basket of things that we, we look at in our definition of fragile, which includes uh, sparsity of population, um, distance from a town or service centre, um, reliance on transport such as ferries and, and others. So I, I probably missed some. And demographics. But that's OK, that's fine. I just wondered. So it is an objective yeah. Yeah. measure. That's fine. Um, going back to performance measurement targets, which have been mentioned already, uh, as I understand it, you comfortably met all of your targets for last year. 
Now, that strikes me as a little bit unusual. I mean, if we look at the health board, they'll meet some and they'll not meet others. If we look at the railways, they'll meet some, they'll not meet others. That is quite normal uh, because they, I would say, they have got challenging targets and they're unlikely to meet them all. So are your targets too easy? Well, we didn't feel so. And, uh, and in some cases, it was a, was a challenge to reach them. However, I can assure you that we've had exactly the same conversation with the high board who are asking exactly the same question. So we will be ensuring that uh, the, we take on board any comments about the challenging uh, nature of our targets. I have to say in the year to date, uh, we are seeing some areas lagging behind in our um, set of targets. So uh, one of them is the uh, amount of turnover of supported companies, which has derived through internationalising. And we're finding that looking quite a struggle at the moment. So at points in the year, some of these targets uh, can look quite difficult, and some of those do at the moment. Has and the High Board approved this year's targets? Are they the ultimate approval? Yes, that's right. right. Uh, so going forward, there's going to be the strategic board. What will they have input into the, this, that kind of specific level? So we want what we're working with the strategic board to ensure that uh, the the performance measures and targets that we use can contribute and that the, the data that we produce can be aggregated up to the specific measures which the strategic board requires to track. But in terms of the governance arrangements remain unchanged in relation to high per, highest performance reported to its board and to our sponsoring department. So, so is the strategic board would just add together what you and SE and South of Scotland are doing, they wouldn't come back to you and say you need more jobs because, for example, as I understand it, the, uh, the number of jobs was 981, we said, and the range appeared to be 700 to 900. So you're not expecting the strategic board will come back and say, no, you've got to do 1,000, you've got to do 1,200, something like that. So the, the, the focus of the strategic board will be uh, slightly different in terms of what it is looking to track in terms of the performance measures which ultimately um, focus on improvements in productivity, which is the overriding objective of the strategic board. So working with the strategic board's analytic unit uh, to make sure that what we can produce from the data of the interventions that we make can be taken, extracted from our systems to contribute towards the uh, coherence of the targets for the strategic board. Right, I'm not sure I'm 100% clear. You used the word track there, which suggests quite a passive role for the strategic board. I mean, do you see them being more passive or more active? I, I'm sure they will be very active. I suppose what I'm, I'm trying to articulate is that they would be looking at a different set of specific measures so that the strategic board is not the aggregate of the measures that we are reporting on individually, but a set of measures which the strategic board determines as the important uh, measures for uh, looking at both activities and outcomes and impacts, uh, which will make the difference to the overall prize of improving Scotland's performance in terms of productivity. Sorry okay. if that didn't come across clearly. Well, that's okay, thanks. Um, and uh, I've just got one other area I really want to touch on, maybe following on from... Angela Constance is questioning, we got the uh, summary of the gender pay gap report, which was helpful, but, but one or two words jumped out at me, which were, um, Hi is fully supportive of promoting the Scottish Business Pledge as a voluntary measure, and then later on it says we are supportive of the drive to encourage more businesses to report on the gender pay gap. Now, n these are quite kind of gentle words, it seems to me. I mean, would it not be possible for you to say to company X, if you want help from us, you have got to sort the gender pay gap. You have got to uh, follow up with the business pledge. So the approach we have taken has been very much about uh, promoting the benefits of um, equal pay and gender um, balance uh, and elements of the uh, fair work agenda through the pledge and others. We track that information through a, a set of uh, ladders that we have. So we have a business values ladder that we work with our uh, account managed businesses on so that we can actually determine where they are at the start of their account managed journey and be able to demonstrate that that is actually a progressive journey for them. But yes, it is true to say at the moment our approach is about uh, working and supporting the benefits of the, those approach uh, rather than looking at any negative or conditionality approach. 
Yeah. One of my colleagues will follow up on that, so thanks okay. very much. That's great. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, a recent David Hume Institute report highlighted the fact that in 2016-17, Scotland spent over a billion pounds on enterprise and economic development. Now, that's a much higher um, amount per head than most other parts of the UK. How can we be sure that that spend has actually improved our economy more than, for example, if it was invested into education or other contributory areas? How, how, would, you, how would you respond to that? So that's a, that's a very big question. Sorry, I'm not familiar with the report that you referenced, but in, in terms of the, the, the general point, um, that is a, a key question that we look at, and I guess is also part of the agenda for the strategic board is, are we <coughs> deriving the right value and impact from our investment uh, through the enterprise and skills agency? I think a, a key point I'd maybe <coughs> like to highlight is what exactly we are measuring. Um, we've spoken uh, this morning here about the role Highlands and Islands Enterprise has in working with social enterprises, about working with communities. And for our approach to holistic uh, economic development, being able to demonstrate those social impacts are equally important as, say, for an example, um, a straightforward return on investment type of leverage calculation. So I, I would just maybe be cautious about trying to compare apples and pears without knowing the, the reference document that you're talking about. But uh, our overall strategy and Scotland's economic strategy gives equal place to inclusive growth and being able to measure that through the work from a Highlands and Islands point of view that we do in relation to supporting communities and social uh, enterprises as working with businesses and investing in infrastructure are all part of the components that develop a, a prosperous economy. Uh, certainly work that we have done in the past has demonstrated that the, the long-term nature of some of those investments is really important too. So being able to, to track investment over a long period of time as an agency that's been around for a long time, that's something we are able to look back and demonstrate. Uh, we started off the conversation this morning about broadband investment. I would suggest that that's one of the most critical investments that can be made at this point in time for um, the economic development of Scotland as a whole and for the Highlands and Islands to keep pace with that too. The report I referenced was purely in the, from the purpose of highlighting the billion pounds being a very large sum of money that's being invested back into the economy. And I understand the responses you've made, but I still don't see how you could weigh the two, you know, the present system where you're put, where you, which you're following, or what if it went to an alternative place? Like, again, education, which is so important, a good chunk of that money going in there would be transformational. So how do you measure whether it might be better to put the money elsewhere as to the present model? And is the present model that you've got changing at all? Is it, is it, is it, is it flexible enough? Uh, so uh, as an agency, I think we do have a, a high degree of flexibility to uh, work within the remit and parameters that we have. I guess to be fair, the decision making about whether to invest in enterprise or education is not one that we make. We take the funds that are given to us through Scottish Government and invest them in the areas where our remit operates, which are around business investment, community investment, and infrastructure investment overall. So then we are making, I guess, relative choices between how we use that within those parameters. I, I, and I think the, um, the questions that you raise are really those that are behind the formation of the strategic board, which is looking at the composite work of both the enterprise and skills agency, and asking some of those bigger questions of the way that the agencies work together. You've highlighted several times the question of the 981 jobs that have been created. That's a, that's a very raw measurement. And one thing that uh, I'd be very interested in is the quality of these jobs. Are they high-end jobs? You know, difference between shelf stackers and you know people that are involved in R&D or, or or something similar. Obviously, I would have hoped that you would have some sort of a, a thrust to bringing in the higher end jobs into the area. 
Yes, absolutely agree. That's a very important point. Uh, um, we, we look at that particularly in relation to the wage rates. So we are tracking the wage rates and actually set uh, a measure of ensuring that uh, the average wage of the jobs supported is higher than the regional average wages. So that gives us a proxy in terms of quality through pay. Uh, the, the jobs that we support are a mix, so that there are a number um, in R&D, for example. They will tend to be focused in areas such as Inverness. So given our uh, requirement and strategic imperative to make sure that we support all parts of our um, patch, then there are areas where simply some of those types of jobs don't exist. So there may be uh, support into sectors which may well be lower paying, but are absolutely critical to uh, the sustainable communities that I spoke about earlier. So we're conscious that that is a mix, and we track uh, across uh, the areas within the Highlands and Islands that average, average wage uh, that's uh, created through the jobs that we support and what the average wage is in each of those sub-regional areas so that we can track that. And it perhaps wouldn't surprise you that areas such as the city of Inverness are higher. Actually, uh, places like uh, Shetland also can attract quite a high wage level, no doubt. That, in fact, that is around the oil and gas activity. Areas such as um, the Western Isles, uh, parts of the Western Highlands, such as uh, Northwest Sutherland, those wage rates do tend to be lower have uh, any information on the breakdown of these 981 jobs? How many do fall into the category of higher on average income? Yes. So, so I don't have that to hand, but certainly happy to supply that. That would be helpful. It can be interesting just to see how that breaks down. I'm going to ref refer again to the David Hume report, although I realise you have not had access to that. The report concluded that how well firms are managed is strongly associated with the productivity. Now, Scotland has relatively low productivity levels compared to other countries. So, quite simply, do we conclude that uh, Scottish companies are badly managed? So, oh, I mean, we, we provide a lot of support uh, on management and leadership to um, account managed businesses because we recognise the importance of those elements to successful businesses. So we do uh, a range of uh, leadership development, including emerging leaders, um, uh, senior leaders within organisations, so that um, there is a focus on supporting businesses with that management journey overall. Um, and it's critical that we provide that kind of support. Uh, we've also uh, done quite a lot of work in terms of entrepreneurial activity, uh, support businesses through uh, attendance at MIT in Boston, for example, as a, as a flagship uh, of our entrepreneurial support. Do you track uh, growth in productivity at all or, or the impact of your support on these companies in terms of driving better productivity? We certainly do. Um, with with um, the businesses that particular we've helped through our high high end leadership programs, we we look at them and how their businesses are performing. And in terms of some of the case studies we've got, we have some very good results um, from businesses across um, the patch who really feel that they have benefited from engaging in those programs and you can see that through the performance of their business and the growth of their business. So I do, again, I don't have stats to hand, <clears throat> but we have some very good case studies that we could share with you in terms of the leadership programs. I think as Charlotte said, <clears throat> some of the developments we've made in our leadership programs over the last few years is actually not looking at just the current leaders, but the emerging leaders and the future leaders as well, because those are the people that are going to, to drive the growth of those businesses in the, in the future. And um, some of the challenges through the, the work that we've been doing um, with our partners um, in the enterprise and skills system has been around how you, you get those, those future leaders coming through the system, how you tackle some of the challenges, for example, in family-owned businesses and succession planning and energising the younger generation. So it's getting them at the, the various stages in that, in that journey. Given the, state, the apparently correct statement that's made that... Uh, if firms are well managed, then productivity improves, gets better. Do you see signs of that? I mean, Scottish productivity is low. So, again, is that a straight link? 
to bad management, poor management? Do you see do you see any of that? Maybe that's a fairly kind of a binary view. I think we see uh, supporting uh, management and leadership within an organisation's capability as well as looking at its business structures, its approach to investment and work practices as all part of a tailored account managed approach. Uh, and I think I could say with some confidence that where all of those are functioning really well and yes, you have a good business that is very productive uh, is very productive and seeing that investment in in the people side of the business and in the management development and capability of the business does pay dividends in terms of the bottom line again uh, if that's helpful to demonstrate through case studies we can absolutely do that absolutely thank you very much and now gordon mcdonald <coughs> thanks very much convener apart from brexit the um, increased use of artificial intelligence and automation is the, or the fourth industrial revolution, is the next biggest challenge facing our economy. Uh, a report in August from SCDI and the Royal Society of Edinburgh and others, Automatic for the People, highlighted over 800,000 jobs, or around 30% of the total, are at high risk of automation. What steps is your agency taking to prepare businesses and employees for the challenges of automation? Uh, yes, and I, and I think our approach is actually about uh, trying to support that investment in automation and uh, productivity. So particularly working with the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service and the development of the manufacturing uh, sector of e excellence uh, as great facilities to support that development. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, actually we do have a challenge in skills and workforce and labour, so actually uh, improving investment in automation is one of the key solutions to that challenge, particularly in a big sector in the Highlands and Islands like food and drink, then yeah, we say there's definitely a scope for greater investment in automation. There are one or two really good examples where that is working. There are still a number of companies that have a journey to go on there. Uh, we, by tracking the investments that are made in our, our account managed companies, have noticed that some of that is needing a bit more influence and investment to make some of those uh, investments happen. And I think that probably goes back to the confidence question that we spoke about earlier, which we track through our business panel survey. Um, you, you mentioned about the fact that the skills challenge is, is there a, a need to tie up business support with a, a, a condition that employ, employers um, increase their uh, expenditure in work learning? So a bit of conditionality in getting that business support if we have the skill shortages that you suggest? Uh, so uh, as I referenced earlier, our approach has been about incentivising and positive benefits rather than conditionality. And obviously, work closely with our partners in skills development Scotland uh, in terms of some of that um, use of uh, modern apprenticeships, for example. And we have uh, supported uh, in work training through supporting companies directly as well. So, uh, to ensure Scotland is a front runner in this fourth industrial revolution. What is your agency doing to bring together the private sector, public sector and government agencies so that they work collaboratively to take advantage of, of these this challenge that's facing us? So uh, there is a, a leadership group which has been set up by uh, Scottish Government, uh, chaired by Cabinet Secretary, to actually do exactly what you're saying there, to bring together the agencies and skills agencies to have that focus on delivering the potential through uh, the Manufacturing Centre of Excellence and supporting that approach overall. I guess it's early days for that yet, but uh, there is a very clear focus on um, being able to take advantage of those uh, substantial opportunities that are open to Scotland. And I do feel that um, there is a degree of underinvestment in companies in the Highlands and Islands. So we see it as our role to support them to make that investment, to use our funds to leverage their investment for the future. And there, the great incentive is actually the fact that if cheap labour supply is not available, then that is absolutely, so it opens the door for that conversation perhaps more than it might have done in the past. It's an absolute imperative to do that. 
And, and just my last point I was going to raise was um, the, the report I referenced earlier on uh, states in it that Scotland lacks strategic leadership for the fourth industrial revolution. Is that a fair criticism? I think that probably needs to come from business and where you have um, those that lead the way, um, there is nothing better as a leader than seeing a successful business and being able to use that as a leadership model. I think as public sector agencies, we can provide the support and the development, but actually a lot of that leadership actually really comes from the business community uh, uh, itself. And it's our job to be able to support that and take those great examples and use those to uh, demonstrate both the benefits and approach to other companies. Yeah, thanks so much. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, that concludes the first uh, session, and um, we'll break, uh, just go to private session for a few minutes to allow changeover witnesses. Thank you very much for coming in today.
Welcome back. And um, we now have with us from Scottish Enterprise uh, a panel, Ian Scott, Chief Financial Officer. Welcome to you. Steve Dunlop, sorry, Chief Executive, and Linda Hanna, Managing Director for Strategy and Sectors. So welcome to all three of you. And um, we'll start our questions with questions from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener, and welcome uh, today. A few uh, questions. First, on the question of jobs, you've created, eight, I think, in 2017, 18, eight and a half thousand jobs um, through the attraction of inward investment. Um, is that the total job creation, or are there other areas in which you've created jobs? Um, so, in terms of the inward investment job numbers, that's the, the planned number that we've um, captured in all the conversations that we've had with companies, but we estimate that over the support that we provide, based on our evaluation and all our research evidence, that over the next three years that that number could be um, much greater in terms of the wider indirect uh, impact on the economy. And we're happy to kind of provide those figures to you if that would be helpful. And do you, we heard earlier from Helen Snell's Enterprise about how they analyse the additionality that their support provides to jobs? Presumably you undertake a similar exercise or is it slightly different? Absolutely, we, we do do a similar exercise. So we, we do that at a couple of levels. So when we work with an individual company, we'd be talking to them about their growth plans. We'd baseline with them what their current position is in terms of their employment. We talk to them about the plans that we're working with them on and then the impact that that would have. And then we'd work with them over a period of time. So we do that at the individual level. In, in a particular project that we might support, so something like RSA, we'd be looking at job numbers as part of that and also the quality of those jobs. Um, so, uh, so we would look at that. And we would also look at through our evaluation and evidence work in terms of things like, and for example, last year we evaluated our investment activity and our exporting activity, some of which I think we shared with the committee. So we then do an evaluation to see what actually happened. And part of that includes looking at uh, making sure that that's as a direct result of what we do and not just something that would happen anyway. Okay, thanks very much. In your um, business plan, uh, you commit to tracking progress in a number of areas, including um, outcomes achieved in areas of disadvantage, number of social enterprises, employee-owned companies and cooperatives supported, investing in youth, um, playing an active role in the community. Um, where did these come from? Why were you not looking at some of these before, or were you, but you're just doing it a little bit more explicitly? Could you say a little bit more about the significance you attach to these? Yeah, um, we, we have certainly kind of increased our focus in those areas over the, in those areas over the last few years. Um, since um, our, our focus ha has been pushed towards in inclusive growth uh, a number of years ago, we've been trying to build up the the type of evidence that we'd want to uh, review in that area. Um, and um, we are certainly tracking measures on those for the for the current year, and we'll be able to report on those towards the tail end of the year. So, that, so, so our sense would be that we have been doing some of this for some time, but I think we would all agree and all the evidence around productivity suggests that we need to do much more in this area in terms of how we generate inclusive growth and how that growth is spread. And one of the things that we've learned over the years is that um, by introducing tracking measures, we can learn from that just in terms of what works, what works in certain areas and certain circumstances, and then look at how we can then roll that out, put some specific targets behind them, and then make sure that we focus on that. So for us this year, we've got a group, as you've described, that kind of tracking measures that we set out in our business plan to help us make sure that we can really capture that data and then use it much more actively, not just in terms of the individual elements, but how they sit together in, in our conversations with companies. So we've already been doing that this year. Uh, we do that across the characteristics of the pledge uh, for all our account managers portfolio. We're looking at that, as you've said, around spe specific things like youth and about particular areas. And what we're certainly be looking to do in this year's work is share that, obviously, with, our, with the Scottish Government and the strategic board partners and make sure that we use that as we develop our plan for, for next year for Scottish Enterprise. So, so it's fair to say that some of this is sort of brand new for you? Um, s some, of it's, uh, some of it's, I wouldn't say it's all brand new, but there's a greater focus on it. And there is a greater um, understanding just in terms of how the things work together. Okay, thanks very much. Um, your grant and aid's fallen by 27% in real terms since 2008 9, um, but obviously you've also had uh, increasing income from uh, other sources. Can you say a little bit about 
the um, what that's meant for your um, ability to deliver the your statutory obligations. Yeah, can you can you sorry can you remind me what was the, the date that you started? Two thousand and eight nine. Yeah, so yeah. a decade ago. Yeah, um, the, the th things have changed quite significantly over that that decade. Clearly, uh, the last few years we've actually um, we are sorry in the early part of that we saw the decline in our uh, funding, but in the last few years we've actually seen that kind of level out, and actually we're we're pleased with the increase that we got in the uh, funding allocation last year. Uh, I think from the government it was up from about 218 million up to 289 million, uh, and we've augmented that with the, the income, as you say. Um, so over the period we, we've had to prioritise where we um, where we invest those resources, and we'll continue to do that. Should those numbers continue to increase, then we've got a, a strong pipeline of other activity that we can, we can use those resources for. So a significant part of the new resources have been financial transactions. Yeah, that's right. Um, can you say something about? Um, how you're in, what your views are on how that should be invested, lent, spent, whatever the appropriate word is. Yeah, I mean, for, for a number of years, we have had the Scottish Investment Bank as part of our operations. Uh, in previous years, we uh, funded that through capital funding, um, but the nature of their activity lends itself very much to financial transactions funding, given that that's restricted to loans or equity investments. Um, we've seen over the last three years, I think that's increased from about 14 million to 45, and then last year up to 88 million. Uh, our activity in that area is more about the 55 to 60 million, I think, for the uh, Scottish Investment Bank activity. So we're now looking at using those financial transactions for, for other areas within the organisation, but we've certainly been able to utilise the majority of that through our direct investment uh, function within the organisation. I think, it, I think it does lend huge opportunity for us to partner in a different way than we have been in the past. So as we look forward to you know, long-standing strategic relationships with universities, with uh, local authorities and so on and so forth, I think, that, I think that financial transaction money will be something that will become much more useful uh, in the future. Uh, so we are in the process of, of spending that, but understanding how do we get absolute best value and, and strategic output from that uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. And um, finally, a question about Russia. You um, you note in your annual report that you closed the office um, in Moscow, uh, and it was apparent early this year that plans to uh, develop five million pound trade links with Russia have been put on ice because of political developments. Can you say something about the? Uh, impact this has had on long-standing trade, like in things like Harris Tweed, where there was a lot of work. Uh, undertaken? I, I, I don't know the specifics on the impact on trade, but I know we're still servicing that region. We're just doing it out of our Nordics office now as opposed to an office in Moscow. Uh, I think we had two permanent staff there uh, and we're now servicing that uh, from a different area. So, so we're still encouraging organisations to uh, to export into that to that region and supporting them in doing so. So you're doing, you're doing just as much as you were before, just administratively differently? Well, we're certainly doing it administratively differently. We're supporting organisations the same way we've done the same way we've done in the past. I, I don't have any uh, statistics as to how much um, is going there, but we can we can get the, those uh, figures for you. I'm sure we've got them in the SDI team that we've got. Yeah, ha happy to do that. I, th I mean, I think we will continuously review which markets we're in, which countries we're in, in order. I think some talked about value for money. So we, we will want to measure our performance in each uh, of those areas and demonstrate that those are working for us. And, and if there are alternative methods that we can yield just as much or better, then, then we ought to consider those. Uh, uh, so that's something we can you know keep you very close to as we move forward. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Andrew LeConstant. Uh, thank you, Convener. You'll gather um, that I'm interested in how we actively demonstrate inclusive growth uh, and the role of uh, RSA in that. Um, but if I could start just by um, asking that, uh, given in 2017-18, um, you invested, uh, I quote, uh, just over £90 million in inclusive growth, uh, and that is, represents 8% of your uh, operating expenditure. Um, I wonder why, why only... Why only eight percent? 
if I can maybe pick up on that, I, th I think you, you'll see from the move to this year's business plan that we've recognised that the four headings that we were previously using in that year weren't really adequate enough to show what we do uh, in, for, for inclusive growth. Um, we we split our budget um, allocations that year. Well, we, we split the analysis of our expenditure over internationalisation, innovation, investment, and inclusive growth. But of course, uh, you, you'll know fair, fine well that internationalisation, innovation, and investment, the work that we do in those areas, very much contributes towards inclusive growth as well. So we've recognised that in the way that we set out our uh, business plan for 18, 19, uh, to show that all of that is contributing. It, it's really just a, a function of the way that, as I say, we, we split our business plan headings, but it's not a fair reflection to say that we only spent 18 million in that area, far from it. Okay. Is um, RSA, would you say, the biggest component or uh, the main component of your inclusive growth investments? As, as far as expenditure is concerned, let Linda maybe go on to, to some other areas in this. As far as expenditure is concerned, because of the, the levels in there, uh, at about, uh, I think it's about 10 or 11 million pounds specifically for the job related RSA, we, we do other stuff related to capital investment. Uh, it's very much um, on expenditure terms, the biggest element in that. But the work that we're doing, uh, working with companies on workforce innovation, uh, is certainly um, probably more activity that goes on in that area now, albeit not at the same level of expenditure in there. But others may have a view on that. So, so if I can add to that, so I think that, that we certainly have seen a shift in Scottish enterprise in this year's business plan does reflect that, that it's all about inclusive growth. So we will make sure that in all the conversations we're having with companies at a sector level, uh, with our partners, that inclusive growth is absolutely embedded in that. So RSA, because there are often large grants or are seen as large grants, can look like the biggest component. But I would, I, I think we're now in a place where absolutely everything that we do, we're considering that. So when we look at approvals, we're asking about how will this contribute to inclusive growth. Part of that is about the people that would be involved in those companies, if it's a company project, or it's about the supply chain, or it's about community benefit clauses, or it's about what they're doing in terms of CO2, etc. So we're now really building that into everything that we do. Um, so RSA, certainly in terms of the, the larger numbers, would be the biggest kind of headline number. But actually, we're now really baking that into absolutely everything that we do. Okay. Is there the danger that there's an assumption that uh, RAC investment automatically equates to inclusive growth when, as you've indicated, where the investment is, uh, who benefits and, you know, what impact it'll have on the supply chain, etc.? So, so I think I think I think you're right. I think there is no one tool that's actually going to be about inclusive growth. And what we've tried to do is make sure that that is absolutely in every conversation that we have. And given the changes in, in the RSA scheme, increasingly, and the focus that we've got about driving innovation in the economy, R and D grants, for example, we have the same conversation when we are talking to a company about investing in research and development, about how that's going to drive that company forward. Uh, what types of um, activities they'll be undertaking, what types of jobs, what does that mean in the supply chain, how can we work with them on that, do we need to work with groups of companies to take advantage. So I think all of the work that we do now is about making sure that we drive that forward. I think we need to do more to raise awareness and using case studies and stories about the investments that we make and also bringing highlights to some of the work that's happening at a sectoral level. So I think we talked about here previously at the committee around the sector productivity plans where the industry was looking looking at how they could push that forward and a lot of that's about inclusive growth and about the types of things that they're doing to respond to the change in jobs and the change in markets and the change of kind of processes and technologies that they've got. So there's a much broader group of things and, and I, I agree with you, I think we need to make sure that that doesn't come, become just about one scheme. And can you say a little bit more about how um, inclusive growth is explicitly uh, connected with your uh, performance targets. What, what I'm driving at, it's very easy to use inclusive growth as a sound buy and say it's integral to, to, to everything. Uh, and I know that in, that you have inclusive growth performance targets, you know, developing leadership uh, through SE support, uh, increasing capacity to create uh, internationally competitive uh, early stage ventures. But could you talk about the threads that uh, actively um, demonstrate that link between inclusive growth and your performance targets? 
So, so in terms, so we've got a range of performance targets, as you know, in our business plan this year, and we've simplified those down to six to make that clearer and, and more specific in terms of what we do. But if I can pick an example, like, um, so I mentioned R&D. So if we, we're looking at supporting a company on R&D, we will quite, and we're going to give them an R&D grant or they've asked us for that, we will explicitly have a conversation with the company about what they're going to be doing. We'll have talked to them about the pledge. We'll have talked to them about the elements within the pledge in terms of living wage, in terms of the other, uh, in terms of not using exploitative um, zero hours contracts, in terms of how they supply suppliers. We'll have spoken to them about all of that. If it's a, a project that is looking to be um, helping companies to adopt, for example, Industry 4.0, we'll again be talking to them about the skills element. Are they talking to uh, local schools? Are they talking to local colleges? So, so there's an element of this that's about very direct in terms of our own advice and our financial support, but part of it's also about how we connect them much more into the community and about the wider aspects of that that will start to kind of generate inclusive growth. And for each of our performance measures, those types of um, conversations are ongoing with companies or ongoing with our partners, particularly in terms of uh, the kind of sectoral work that we do. And I'm happy to share that with you and kind of, and maybe kind of give you some examples of what that looks like. Okay, examples would be uh, help helpful, thanks. Um, in, in, and given that, you know, promoting inclusive growth actually means, you know, addressing uh, economic inequalities, particularly uh, within a regional level and between uh, regional levels, Scotland's a small country, but, you know, uh, the, the various local economies uh, all have very different uh, challenges and, and needs. So I wondered, you know, can, can Scottish Enterprise demonstrate, um, you know, where foreign direct investment, for example, um, is being attracted to, um, although I accept some of the points made uh, in your briefing note that some of this is about expansion as opposed to, uh, you know, brand new investments. Uh, and also in terms of where endeavours are targeted at, you know, the, the specific local areas that have the, the highest employment gaps. I think we can clearly evidence where the FDI, where those uh, inward investments are, are going, so we can we can share all of that detail. I think, um, to your point, um, to what extent can we begin to target inward investment into areas where we uh, feel that would benefit uh, uh, those investments or from those investments most? We are moving into much deeper partnerships with uh, local authorities, with regional economic partnerships. And out of that, I would anticipate in the future, in the near future, that we'll get inward investment prospectuses for all of those uh, regions that add up to something that, uh, uh, that, that Scotland can sell uh, internationally and globally under the Scotland is now banner. So I think what you see uh, coming forward are, and we already have them in, in, in many areas, but very clear uh, investable propositions uh, that will that will emerge from from each of those uh, regional partnerships um, and therefore that will you know very clearly put on offer uh, uh, to global investors what's available here in Scotland at a national level and a regional level and I think that will aid greatly the final question uh, convener is that the panel will have heard me um, ask uh, Highlands and uh, Islands Enterprise earlier uh, but how they are um, not just uh, contributing to um, uh, closing the, the, the gender pay gap and uh, the underrepresentation of women in particular sectors, but you know more broadly uh, in terms of the fair work agenda, specifically the disability uh, action plan in terms of the uh, disability employment gap. And I'd also be interested to know what your gender pay gap is, what Scottish Enterprises gender uh, pay gap, uh, given that Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, you know, supplied uh, that information to committee. Yeah, I think the, the latest reported figure we've got for Scottish Enterprise is 14.7%. Uh, that was in 2017. Uh, that's come down from 17.6 in 2015 and down from 18.8 .8 in 2013. So we're making progress in that area. Clearly some more work to be done on that. Good. Uh, and in terms of, uh, as a public sector, did you make, making a, a, a contribution to, for example, reducing the disability employment gap? So... 
we so in terms of diversity, it's something that we we don't do enough of, if I'm, if I'm honest, and we need to do more of. And we've been looking at how do we do that and how do we make sure that that's much more kind of pervasive in, in what we do. So you'll know that we do a lot around youth. Uh, you'll know that we, uh, you might know that we've been kind of looking at particularly around women. So we've been tracking the number of female-led uh, businesses that we work with. We've been introducing a, a couple of new programmes in terms of engaging directly with women. So so absolutely listening to that kind of feedback that it's not just about the type of business support, it's about how that's designed in terms of how that engages with women and we've looked at other kind of international examples of that so, so we're kind of doing more on that in, in terms of your point about disabled and kind of um, other kind of areas we're, and disadvantaged, disadvantaged areas and also disabled we're not doing enough and we know that we need to do more but some kind of recent examples that we've had around uh, working with some large inward investors large and small inward investors about how we can uh, support them to do that but also how we can connect them to the people who have that expertise uh, in the community who actually can help um, bring forward, identify people with uh, the skills that that company is looking for and also how they might need to support them. That's something that we, we've got some case studies on, but we know that we need to do more. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Just, I'll just maybe pick out as an example, and we'll share this with you in some detail, is the, is the inward investment we had with Barclays, which are very explicitly going to target uh, 340 new jobs uh, towards disadvantaged and dis uh, disabled uh, 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 recruitment in, in that specific area. We'd like to use that as a case study and amplify uh, the benefits that, that come from that. So that's an area, as Linda says, that we'll be focusing on going forward. Um, just before we move to questions from Jackie Bailey, I mean, on that, that issue of um, uh, disability, are you able to give concrete figures to indicate what success you've had in terms of that thus far? I appreciate you say you need to do better, but can you provide not just case studies, but concrete figures that point to what you have succeeded in that area in accomplishing? Oh. We don't have them in front of us, but we'll make sure that we do that when we provide the case studies. Right. Thank you very much. And now Jackie Bailey. And to money. Um, it, and, and let me just explore with you this notion that somehow you've got a lot more resources because um, having studied the tables going back to 2008, even up to the most recent years, your core grant has in fact either gone down or stayed relatively the same. So it's been more or less flat cash. The difference has been in financial transaction money, which accounts for maybe about a third of your budget. Would, be, would that be a correct interpretation of the tables I have in front of me? I'm sure it is, Jackie. I don't have sight of those tables. So I, 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 I just didn't want, you know, because I think earlier you asserted that the budget had increased you know, quite significantly in the last few years. I don't think that's our experience of your core budget, but of course the financial transaction money, which is a recent development, has made up the difference, by and large. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm taking financial transactions as being part of our core budget. Okay. I, I see that coming through as grant and aid. But, so but, but it's, not, it's not unrestricted. It is for a particular purpose, so you need to use it for that purpose, and therefore not having the flexibility um, is not good in terms of your, your core budget diminishing. That's the only point I'm, I'm trying to make. Yeah, the, the other part of our budget, you could say the same on in our resource budget or our capital budget, that's for certain types of activity as well. Okay. Right, can I move on now to the financial transaction money because there have been underspends this year of 13 million. Um, I understand that there's likely to be a greater <laughs> proportion of your grant is going to be in financial transaction money next year. Um, how did the underspends arise and are you confident that you'll be able to spend all next year given it's increasing? The, I, th I think as you'll see from the accounts um, where, where you're picking up that 13 million, that 10 million of that was specifically for one uh, programme that was the Scottish European Growth um, Fund. Uh, I'm sorry, I've not got the words right on that one, but it's quite a long acronym that we've got for that. That one programme is a very innovative, innovative one that um, that we put together to, to work with the European Investment Fund for them to match the 50 million that the Scottish government was going to put in over a number of years. And then that would be matched again uh, by the investors that the European Investment Fund could bring to that, uh, bringing it up to at least 200 million of investment. Um, we have seen that not progressing to the timescales we originally envisaged. Uh, we were looking at 10 million in year one, then 20 million and 20 million. Um, the, the, there is pipeline there. Uh, the number of deals hasn't come through on that that we expected. Uh, we're working hard to continue to deliver that. Um, the, the government is committed to uh, the £50 million pounds over uh, more than the three years that was originally envisaged to that. Uh, we hope to utilise those funds in due course. 
So that, that correct me if I'm wrong, um, that wasn't announced just in the last programme for government, that was the one before? Uh, yeah, not the one yeah. in September 18. The okay, one the one before that. Um, can you tell me of that sum, how much has actually been allocated and to how many companies? Um, I, I think one or possibly two deals have been done. I think it's one deal that's been done on that uh, since um, the beginning of this financial year because clearly there was none done last financial year and that's why the, the £10 million wasn't utilised last year. The overall value of that, I'm not sure, it'll be in the um, round about a million pounds, but I don't know the exact precise figure for Okay, that. so a very tiny um, amount in terms of you know what would have been envisaged. Would you envisage going forward? What, what's the target that you expect for this year and for next? Uh, we, we've set ourselves a figure of £20 million for this year. Um, there is pipeline there. We're, we're, uh, um, we're, um, I, I can admit we're, we're, that that's um, under a bit of pressure at the moment. Um, we're talking to the government about whether those funds can be used for a further other activity this year at the moment. Uh, we've still to, to bottom out what will happen with that. So we may not do the £20 million that, that was in there. I think, I mean, you can understand our concern. One deal at £1 million out of a substantial pot that was promised much earlier um, doesn't su suggest to me that it's been particularly successful. Um, I, I, I won't comment on the success, okay. but the, you, you'll appreciate the, 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 that particular fund is for uh, low volume, high high value uh, type investments. Where uh, I think we're at, the the plan was to average about two million pounds a time for each investment. Uh, so we're looking at ten investments that would get up to that twenty million pound level. Okay. I, I, I would okay. acknowledge that it is a real challenge. It is a stretch for the organisation. Um, but we've been reporting into our board. There's complete visibility in the organisation, and, and I am taking this very very seriously and marshalling all our resources to try and execute against what Ian says is a positive pipeline there. But this is quite a shift for us, and and, and, and I see, you know, cranking up this machine, you know, into those wider, deeper strategic partnerships is a, is the way to you know to deliver on that. So recognise the challenge. We see it, uh, but I'd like to give you some confidence that we are we are trying to address that. There's an expectation, is there not, that you will sell land and assets um, during the course of any given financial year and that contributes to, um, or the government at least thinks it contributes to, um, how you operate. Um, can you tell me, do you have a figure for 1819 and 1920? And particularly, do you anticipate um, a receipt from the iconic leisure development um, that's planned and how much that receipt is? Uh, okay, uh, on the, the latter one, first of all, as you'll be well aware, I'm sure, that's in the kind of early planning stages at the moment. I think a uh, kind of planning application has been put into the, uh, the National Park Authority. On that one, I'm not certain on what the timescales of going through that planning exercise, never mind the, the kind of sale of the land will be, uh, but I know that we will have the option to, to decide on what, what the deal is uh, should uh, Iconic Leisure uh, get the plan permission they're looking for and want to continue with that deal. Um, Do you have an estimate of how much you think will be realised? Surely you forecast that in your accounts going ahead? Um, we, we, we forecast in general terms our, our property sales. I think the first part of your question was how much are we anticipating for this year. Um, in total, I, th I think it's detailed in our business plan, but in total property uh, sales and income from property comes to about £18.6 million. Pounds. Uh, I think our business plan shows, yeah, property disposals 14 as uh, the figure as part of that, and uh, property income 4.6. Um, I, I believe the iconic leisure one is in the kind of low low millions, one possibly two million from from memory. But I, again, I can confirm uh, what the value is that we put on that land in, in their last year's accounts. I don't have that in front of me. Just that now. would be very helpful. Thank you, okay. uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank, thank you, convener. I just wanted to follow up on Jackie Bailey's question about the European Investment Fund because I understand that's part of the Scottish Growth Scheme which was announced two years ago as the £500 million package of loans uh, and guarantees for Scottish business. But I understand no loans have been issued under that scheme. It's now an equity investment programme where there's some co-investment between Scottish Enterprise and private equity fund managers, but the terms are set by the private equity fund managers. Can you give us a bit of background as to why that programme changed so significantly from a programme of loans to a programme which is effectively an equity investment programme run by uh, private equity funds? Uh, I, I can talk about the European side of that, but that's just one element of the Scottish growth scheme that had has got loans in it as well. I, I think the Scottish Growth Fund was, was, is part of that uh, as well, which 
um, has has got loans as part of it. Um, that that was the element that we, that we developed is through the European side. That didn't change in its um, formation. It was always um, deemed to be equity type investment when we when we formed it um, just over a year ago. So of the five hundred million pound headline number that was announced, how much has been allocated so far? Did you have that number? I, I don't have that number in total for 500. I don't think we're, we're responsible for the full 500 in there. The 200 of that, I think, relates to the European fund that I explained earlier, was 50 million from government, um, matched by 50 million from Europe, and another 100 million, at least, probably more than that, from the equity investors. And do you have a final question on this point? Do you have a, do you have a timeline as to when that 200 million might be utilised? How, how does it match with the pipeline you're seeing coming, coming down the track? Yeah. Similar to my, to my answer to Jackie, you know, originally envisaged that the 50 million that we were putting in would be 10, 20 and 20. Um, I think it'll take a significantly longer than that, a number of years longer than that. I, I don't know exactly when it'll be. We're at early stages in that. There is some pipeline, but one deal's been done, I think, possibly two. Uh, so Just to flesh that out a bit, what, what are the main obstacles in terms of matching the pipeline with, with the funding? What's, is it a, an organisational issue or is it a funding issue or is it pipeline not appropriate? Uh, we, we're, we're trying to generate the pipeline for the equity investors and the European Investment Fund. Uh, obviously, they're putting in the majority of the money into those cases, so they need to um, consider the cases that are being brought forward. Uh, we're certainly generating the pipeline for them, but uh, that's not obviously seen its way through into actual deals yet. Um, we're working with them to try and deliver on those. I, I don't see any reason why that won't happen. It's just taking longer to do. Okay, thank you. John Mason. Hey, thanks, thanks, convener. Um, if you were... I don't know if you were listening to my questions to the HIE, but it's a very similar one, uh, namely on performance measurement targets. Now, I see in your report that there's lots of little green triangles, which I think are positive, uh, that you've either matched or uh, exceeded your targets. But again, as with HIE, you know, it does, I suppose it surprises me a little bit because in other organisations like the railways, like the health service, we don't really expect them to meet all their targets. We expect them to achieve some and miss a few, that's normal. Uh, so uh, does it suggest that your targets are too easy if you've met them all? Uh, it's a similar answer to the, that I heard coming from uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. We've had the same discussion with our board and our previous chairman a, a number of times on this. I think if you asked any of the individuals in our organisation who are trying to deliver on those, they, they would definitely not agree that they're easy targets. I think if you look over the three years of the last business plan, you'll have seen those targets increasing year on year. And when you look at the ones we've been in this year, there's a significant increase in a number of areas, particularly in the innovation side in there. We go through the year tracking these, and to be honest, albeit we had finally achieved them last year, I think it was up until about month 10 that we were forecasting that we, would, that we wouldn't do that in at least one area, probably two areas. The inward investment jobs, I, I recall, was a, uh, wasn't looking uh, very good at one point. It, we're in a similar position this year, again, that they're under a lot, of, a lot of pressure to try and deliver on those. There's one for this year we're currently forecasting that we won't do, but we're putting extra effort into to being able to achieve that. So there's a lot of good work goes into achieving these targets. So. And, and again, it's, it's your own board that has up till now completely approved these. There's not been government input in the specifics of targets and things. Yeah, other than the, the government agreeing our overall plan that, that we put forward to them before we publish it at the end of every or at the beginning of every year, uh, there's no direct input onto those ones other than they say that they're happy with the overall level and the overall plan that we're putting together. Uh, but yeah, the governance, uh, like high stays with the Scottish Enterprise, um, as far as I know. But, I mean, obviously, you're reviewing how you do things, but the big change will be the strategic board coming in as well. C can you explain how they will relate to this, you setting your plan, you're setting the performance targets, will they have a direct input or indirect, or how does that all work? Yeah, um, we, we sit on the, on the strategic board, so the chairman of Scottish Enterprise, along with the chair, people of the other organisations are part of that board. And, and what you heard from Charlotte earlier is that they are setting um, uh, new ambitions for the economic system, the collection, that family of organisations that are that are coming together to act much more cohesively. So they are they are binding those organisations together with strategic targets, four pillars um, um, that will uh, that you'll see uh, uh, shortly at the end of October, and and they they will come out with new targets and new and and some more specific than others. They will be longer term. Some of them will be twenty year horizons. Some of them will be much shorter, uh, and they will. 
they, if you like, are being created, formed, shaped, influenced, challenged by uh, multiple uh, 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 different bodies, and ultimately will flow into uh, the, the operating plans of each of the agencies. So they will have a, a, a strategic shaping direction of travel influence, and then each of the boards and the organisations will then go into their budget planning cycle and, and respond accordingly. And that's what we'll do. Uh, as, uh, as Highlands and Islands said, they'll be uh, having a, a draft um, uh, attempt at next year's plan at the end of October and we'll be doing the same. So, I mean, you used the word strategic there, which is fine. So that's the kind of bigger picture. Um, and you said, I think that some uh, areas will be more specific than others as to how they get involved. So, I mean, I don't know if you can tell me this at the moment, but I mean, if we take something like jobs, which tends to be something that we are interested in, you know, would, they, would they, the strategic board go as far as setting new jobs for the whole of Scotland, which would then be subdivided between HIE and yourselves, or do you not think they'll get into that specific level of detail? I don't think they'll get into that granular detail. I think, for example, the example I'd give you is exporting, you know, where we know that our foreign direct investment over recent years has been very good, um, but actually we need to begin to focus on uh, exporting because we can do much better. Therefore, there are some emerging targets that will, that will come from the strategic board around where we want, a, as a collective system, to, to try and aim for in relation to uh, export targets, and that's something that we'll do as individual bodies, but we'll try to bring along the private sector as well. So they, so they will have indicative high-level targets that we collectively feel are achievable, and then we'll go away and work and work out a lot of the detail, but having been part of the creation of those targets in the first instance. So, again, you may not be able to answer this, but I mean, you know, if we said that maybe companies in your area are bigger and more used to exporting than in the Highlands and Islands area, w would you expect that when that overall picture has been split that you might take proportionately more of the share to try and get SE companies exporting more? Or, again, would that just be entirely up to HIE, what they thought they could do, and yourselves what you could do? Mm. Um, in, in relation to exporting, we, we have got, we've got Scottish Development International, which we lead on, but that's a partnership between Highlands and Islands and ourselves and government and the emerging south of Scotland. So those targets will be set for, for each area and for Scotland overall, and, and, and therefore that organisation, that part of the organisation will try to drive collective targets. And again, I went back to individual prospectuses for each region there are there are specific action plans in each area with specific targets so so it goes from a very high level down into granular level and we'll be able to give you some of that detail if that helps okay that's great thanks and um colin bt convener um i'd like to ask you perhaps somewhat similar questions as i did the previous panel and again i would reference the david hume institute report which highlighted in 2016-17 uh, Scotland spent over a billion pounds on enterprise and economic development, which is a much larger sum per head than most other parts of the UK. How can we be sure that that money has been spent on improving our economy? And how can we prove that investing it in other areas, which would have an impact on our economy as well, things like education and so on, would that would that be a better route? Um, again, similar to, to Charlotte's response, that, that's a matter for government about where it places its, uh, its resources to have the biggest impact on economic growth. I think if, you, if you're, um, and we'll, maybe Linda can go into some, some, um, some detail, but there's no question in my mind, and, and certainly having worked across economic development over a long period of time and south of the border, um, there was you know, a great deal of, 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 of pain felt when the enterprise companies in that part of the world were, uh, were, were, were taken away. So, you know, so from being in that, that area before, um, for me, there was no doubt that, that stopping an enterprise agency uh, um, had, an, had an impact. Now, um, for me, uh, again, at a tactical level, there's no doubt when we are landing um, inward investment like a Barclays or foreign direct investment, if, if it wasn't for us, the question would be who would, be, who would it be? 
and very often the, the information that comes back is that you know that this deal, these deals, these attracting these businesses would not have happened without without intervention, without people uh, selling what Scotland has to offer. And that's not just you know financial resource; that's the skills package. It's, it's what other uh, uh, um, uh, support can can be provided. And let's not forget, this is a very very competitive business trying to attract inward investment. Every country in the world is trying to attract uh, uh, companies who will invest in their country and create jobs for their country. And if you don't have something like an enterprise network, you would need something else. So, you know, I, I would respond positively and say that uh, the answer is absolutely yes. We ought to have, we should be spending money to attract and grow our, uh, our economy through foreign direct investment as well as what we do domestically. Um, uh, and I think all the, the evidence that, that we would gather say that the impact that we have makes a difference. Are we spending the right amount of money? I'd like to spend five times the amount. If you could help with that, that would be great. Um, um, we, we, will, we will spend the money. We will live within the, the means that, we, that, that, that are given to us. We, um, we accept that money is tight across the whole economy, and that will always be the case. So we will gratefully receive whatever government uh, want to allocate to us. Our job is to make every pound count. Our, our job is to do that in a collaborative way with our, uh, our family of agencies, and that's where the strategic boards are beginning to uh, 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 make a big, a big impact. And we will We'll need to, you know, respond to all those economic challenges that are coming our way, both in terms of of, uh, of businesses being able to respond to the economic challenges, but also the economic opportunities. And we've heard earlier, we are in very uncertain times. So this is, you know, for me, I I have a sense that you know that Scotland hasn't needed you know Scottish enterprise more than it than it needs it today. So I'm you wouldn't be surprised to hear me say that I'm an advocate for the enterprise uh, uh, system. I think it's working well, and I would and if if you could find some more money for me, I'd be delighted. Thank you. I guess, I guess one of the measures of uh, how the the economy is being improved is obviously jobs, because at the end of the day, really, that's what it's all about. Um, and quality of jobs is extremely important. And you have differentiated there, sh showing that uh, I think it's about must be close to forty percent of the jobs created are HVA. Define HVA. There's a specific um, financial um, uh, benchmark. I think it's above thirty-eight thousand pounds from from memory. Thirty-eight thousand pounds something, but that's a, a kind of financial target. But fundamentally, below that, you know, we we are for more better jobs, you know, and that you know. So, so for us, we want more jobs and better jobs as, in as many places as possible. But there is a specific uh, benchmark to you know to qualify for HV and H monetary. I don't know if it's purely monetary, but that, that's, that's <coughs> one aspect of it. Yeah, I think the, the internationally <laughs> recognised uh, level for that is a percentage above the average wage rates. I think I, I can't recall what that is. Our, our SDI colleagues would help us with that, but uh, that, that's, the, that's the accepted uh, methodology for that at the moment. Okay, let me, let me just move on to a question on the productivity. Scotland has relatively low productivity levels compared to other countries. Uh, the David Hume Institute report concluded that how well firms are managed is strongly associated with their productivity. Firstly, I would ask, do you agree with that? And secondly, if that's true and we've got such low productivity, does that mean our companies are not particularly well managed? I, I don't think we would challenge um, uh, the, the findings. I think they, they correlate with our, with our own. And, and I think... For us, there are many Scottish businesses that are managed fantastically and they are cutting edge and doing really well, but there is a, a lot that are not following that trend. And that's why we invest heavily in leadership and management you know, across across Scotland. And I think £7 million-ish, but Linda will correct me, is, is targeted towards that area. But there's no doubt about it that we need to be more competitive. Uh, in order to be more competitive, we need to be more productive. And, and part of being more productive, we need to invest more in our people and our research and development and, and export more so... Like uh, I said before, it's a very competitive um, global market that, that we're in and, and we need to look out, find out who's best and, and try and emulate or, or exceed that. But productivity is a big challenge for us, no doubt about it. The linkage between managerial ability and uh, productivity, what are you actually doing to improve management skills in Scotland? So we, we invest heavily in that, in that area and there are m multiple uh, um, um, products and services that we offer, but we'll maybe hand over to... 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Linda give you a couple of specifics. So, so as Steve said, we, we invest heavily around leadership and management, and we don't do that alone, so we make sure that we work with um, other actors that are you know, in that space, particularly um, remarkable investors in People Scotland and others. We've worked very closely with the University of Strathclyde around the fair work agenda and about really understanding what some of those kind of practices look like. Uh, so, so what we do is we would work with a company about looking at uh, what currently what their leadership um, capability is and talking to them about what they need to do for the future. That might be specifically about, um, I was going to say, generic leadership skills, or it could be about helping them understand from a leadership perspective, what's going on in their market, what industries are changed, what the industry changes are, what the kind of technology needs to look like, and then how are they going to cope with that in the kind of workplace. We would, as a big part of what we do around the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service is about leadership and management skills, about the shift that they need to make in terms of um, adopting new technology, how they're going to use the data that comes out of quite a lot of those changes that they have in terms of either new pieces of kit or the kind of reports that they're getting, and then how they drive product activity improvements in the workforce um, and also just in terms of how they manage the kind of logistics of the supply chain. So, so we do that at various levels and we've got various kind of programmes that do that. But we also make sure that in, in all the work we're doing at an industry level that we're making sure that we support and, and enable others to do that. So the productivity action plan, so the food and drink one, um, has very kind of clear elements around how we're supporting management and, and leadership. James Withers, Charlotte mentioned earlier, the National Manufacturing Institute Leadership Group, James is on that, again, to make the link to the food and drink industry about how we support them and how we help many of the leaders understand the changes that they might need to make to be able to respond to what's coming in their industry to be able to kind of keep ahead of that. Thank you. And Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, you were in for the earlier evidence session when I asked Hi about automation, so it's similar questions I'm, I'm going to ask. So, um, What research has Scottish Enterprise undertaken to understand the opportunities and reforms needed to take advantage of automation? kick this one off. So, so we've done quite a lot of work, not alone, so we do this with the industry leadership groups and particularly if you take the, the, the kind of industry 4.0, so particularly around manufacturing and digital, we've done a lot of uh, research looking at what's going on around the world, uh, looking at, at UK level, the industrial strategy and the research that's been done there. So we, we've, we've kind of begged, borrowed and stolen what already exists. We've looked at what we've already got in Scotland and then looked at where we've got opportunities in terms of capability we've got and where there are gaps. So we've looked at that across the piece. A lot of that fed into um, what then created the Manufacturing Action Plan that the Scottish Government announced in 2016. Um, and uh, we do two things around that. So that Manufacturing Action Plan is about helping industry to respond to that. There's a big leadership um, dimension to that that we deliver through SMAS. There's a piece in that around the circular economy. We're doing a lot around skills. So that's about driving demand from companies to say, this is an issue and we need some support and it's an opportunity and we need some support. Um, so I chair um, across all the public sector partners that are involved in making that manufacturing action plan happen. So And that includes at a UK level. So um, Innovate UK is part of that, as well as our partners in Scotland. And then as Charlotte was talking about, we've now... Um, kind of accelerating towards creating the National Manufacturing Institute for the whole of Scotland. So whilst um, the centre will be based in Shinnan, we're looking at how that's going to connect right across Scotland, um, both in terms of the, um, I was going to say the kind of harder side to that in terms of technology, but absolutely the skill side of that. So we're working uh, very hard about how we make sure that connects to lots of colleges, but also then how we get that out into schools. And we're supporting particularly primary engineer to make sure that we can ramp that up right across Scotland. Scotland. So, so we've done a lot in that space just in terms of understanding what's needed and then making sure that we're, we're kind of flowing that through. And on the other side of the equation, um, in terms of the digital piece, so the internet of things um, and about helping kind of companies think about the opportunity around data and digital technologies, uh, we're investing heavily again with our partners. The announcement that's happening in Edinburgh today around 100,000 data scientists around data-driven innovation in Edinburgh is something we're very closely involved in that we need to kind of um, support um, and work with. Um, investing in the, in the Edinburgh Biocourt in terms of the application of that in health around Usher and other things and about making sure that we then take that out into food and drink and tourism and all those industries and we're very actively uh, doing that at the moment and can give you lots of examples of that if that would be helpful. Well, I was going to ask you, um, in your business plan um, you refer 
only once to automation, and that relates to uh, high value manufacturing. And it says to help put Scotland's manufacturers at the forefront of digital technology and automation. But if you look at the uh, Automatic for the People report, it highlights 20 different areas of the Scottish economy that could be impacted by automation. Transportation and storage, 56% of jobs could be at risk. Wholesale and retail, 44% of jobs could be at risk. Uh, I'm just wondering what you're doing uh, to the, you know, to a whole range of business areas rather than just manufacturing. So other than manufacturing, the piece that we're looking at around the digital economy is about understanding how technology applies right across our sectors. So yeah, absolutely. So the automation part of the kind of how we're using technology and automation to do that across um, different industry sectors. So, so certainly from that perspective, Scotland's economy is very diverse and that's one of the benefits that gives us resilience. But it also means that we need to help uh, on many fronts respond to some of those things. So, for example, the work that we're doing around tourism, around automation in terms of thinking about um, how they use that in terms of booking, around payments, about all those kinds of sides of things that we're, we're kind of helping them with that in financial services around automation and particularly fintech a big uh, opportunity we've helped create fintech scotland to help grow that cluster that we've got um, we know that scotland is the kind of most well-developed cluster outside of london but we need to make sure that we really build on that and a big part of that's about startups and about how we're kind of creating more opportunities around that but for example in fife where uh, the new col the college there is looking at a new program to create um, how um, skills around payments, so the automation of that. In the Glasgow context, around the work that we're doing with our partners in Glasgow, we're looking at how we create capability to kind of make sure that we can apply quantum, particularly technologies, in the context of different industry, quantum computing and financial services, but also in terms of other industries like food and drink, etc. So, so we're applying that right across the piece. So in some ways, thinking about demand and supply, how do we make sure that we've got all the centres of excellence and academic and expert practical application and then how do we apply that to all the different industries that we've got and we're making sure we do both. Construction's a really good example of where we're actively doing that at the moment and again really happy to kind of share with you how we're taking that, how do we create the capability and then how do we make sure that all the industries understand and we can dovetail those two things close together. Yeah, I've been to the Construction and Innovation Centre and it's fantastic, so yeah, absolutely. Um, can I add to that? Yeah. I mean, I think... Um, I think it's a really good point, and I think uh, as as things move so quickly ahead of us and, and change and have massive impacts, we are as this family, this collection of of, of agencies, beginning to collaborate more deeply, and, the, and there will be um, the potential for us not just to provide uh, business support in a high quality way to you know to all businesses, but actually that that goes to providing consistent, and clear information and insight uh, in a very real time basis to you know to all our business community, and that way we'll be able to give much more information, insight, support that will then drive how we invest in businesses to help them cope with that degree of uh, change and challenge. So I think it's a big you know, challenge for all of us, but the system is beginning to organise itself in a way to cope with that. But just on that point where you said the system's starting to organise and there's been increased collaboration, is there a need for a Scottish Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, as was proposed last week by one of our witnesses? where it would bring public and private agencies and government agencies together to facilitate discussions about whether we'll, what we want to achieve out of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I, I think that's a good idea. I think, I think those conversations are happening in many places and at different rates. I, um, so I think those who are on top of it are taking advantage of it. I think for me is how do you organise that conversation that makes sure that it's accessible to as many people as possible? And you know, if you take Brexit for an example, it's so complicated, it's so worrying that folks actually just wait to see that it's over, and then and then try to respond to it. You can't do it with this technology. I mean, you have to be part of this, and, and Scotland needs to be the front wave of that. So anything that helps is, uh, you know, we'd be very supportive of. There are many countries across Europe that are, that are looking at this challenge of automation, Finland, Germany, etc. How do we ensure that um, Scotland's at the forefront of the uh, autom automation and artificial intelligence revolution? Well, I mean, I think we've made some significant investments and, and more to come in relation to the Na National Manufacturing Institute, as an example. I think that will have a huge impact 
uh, not just on the major companies, but the whole supply chain. And I think those kind of big strategic investments will make a difference. But um, we need to, you know, work across the whole, you know, the whole patch, across the whole spectrum, uh, and get the whole system working. But um, but there's some, there are fabulous examples of, of, of some, some, some really exciting initiatives at the moment. So there's huge investments going on just now. So, you know, Edinburgh being the data capital of Europe, So, and, and I know that just trips off the tongue, but actually when you really think about what that means in the context of automation, so generating the data, using the data, and then driving improvements and opportunities on the back of that, we absolutely can be at the forefront of that. I, so I think there's a, a confidence and belief that goes with that, and there's significant investments that we and our partners have made about kind of creating that capability. But there's no point in having the capability if companies aren't using it. So the other kind of piece in the story about the connectors, so we support that, and we will drive companies to help understand that. But the innovation centres that we invest in, it's a great example of the kind of collaborative work of the family of agencies, you know, so using the data lab, census, and others that really kind of do that. There really is a kind of an infrastructure now. What we need to make sure, though, is that we're moving together ahead as a country and about making sure that Scotland really takes that advantage because there will be different bits of that capability in different parts of Scotland but it's the, as Steve was kind of describing that kind of prospectus of what it adds up to can be really quite compelling we need to make sure that we follow through on that and we make sure that we do that at scale. So, so I think there is a real appetite for that at the moment. When, when I also look at the investment that's going on in the other side of the city, if you take over the other side of the country or in Glasgow, around particularly the kind of capabilities there, there is huge opportunities and, and it's about making sure we then use that for all parts of Scotland, which we are absolutely committed to doing. And just my final point, you, you, I mean, you highlighted um, about Edinburgh, I want to be the data capital of Europe and FinTech and all the rest of it. Um, does Brexit undermine all that? So, so Brexit is a challenge. It's so the understatement of the day. Uh, so, so Brexit is a huge challenge, but all the conversations that, that we are having, certainly um, with um, businesses and with our partners, is about pressing ahead around what we think needs to be done right now. Clearly, the deal the deal's not clear yet in terms of what that means, so we will need to kind of watch that as it goes. But we are pressing ahead. We're not going to wait for that. And certainly, the work around fintech is a good example. Um, I, we're seeing, you know, our, the number of what's mostly contributed to the growth of the fintech cluster in the last year has been startups. Um, we've seen some inward investment as well, which is great. Um, so we haven't yet seen that. I don't think that we can wait for that. We need to just make sure that we press ahead in terms of what that looks like. Yeah, and, and, and the Barclays investment in Glasgow, the very significant investment at this point in time, which said, spoke to us about, you know, the talent that Scotland has and, and in that area. It talked about the support, the wraparound, you know, from, you know, guaranteeing the skills uh, uh, base going going forward, um, you know, and 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 the competitive cost base that Scotland has. So, so for every challenge that Brexit brings, I think we need to be able to help businesses respond to those challenges, but when there will be opportunities and we need to be really nimble and, and, and be able to take uh, advantage of those opportunities really quickly. Uh, and and, and that, that was a good example that have enormous catalytic effect in, on the city and speak to Scotland being you know, a, a banking centre for the future. So, so, if I well, so that future proofing is really quite important. So, and, and it's really hard because we don't have crystal ball. But really thinking ahead around where is automation going, where are industries going, where are the trade kind of trade flows going, and how do we future proof that as much as possible in the investments that we're making, um, and thinking about where industry is going to be going around that, and then how we use that to attract a Barclays or help companies to expand and get clusters to kind of form around that, and, and particularly in that context. Uh, place making is going to be really quite important because in all of that skills is incredibly important so I think all of that is the kind of approach that, that we're taking around those kinds of emerging industries but also then applying that to our existing industries. Okay, thanks very much. Um, two brief follow-ups first from Dean Lockhart and then Jackie Bailey. Um, thank you convener. Um, a number of new enterprise initiatives have been announced in the past year we've seen the Scottish National Investment Bank being announced the South of Scotland Enterprise Board um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on how best the agencies, the family of agencies, can avoid duplication in, in effort. And on the cost side, I think the estimated costs of setting up uh, the SNIB will be around £30 million. If you add that to the annual running costs of um, the other agencies, you're looking at roughly £130, £140 million a year in running costs before any actual money is invested in the economy. Is there any way the agencies together can, ad can address the cost side issue and the duplication issue? 
Well, first thing, I mean, in behalf of uh, Scottish Enterprise, we are you know, very supportive of both those initiatives. So we will do all we can around, you know, transitioning the Scottish Investment Bank into the the National Investment Bank, and those will those will be different things, you know, serving serving uh, different purposes. Um, and therefore, it's really important that we manage that process really smoothly, that there's no disruption to the market, and that folks understand what that change is about, so that we don't have any pause in in, in investment. So we're really committed to that. Um, but it's also important the relationship between between the future National Bank and all of the agencies and how we collaborate and make sure there's a, a really good understanding of not just what each other do, but what's the relationship between uh, the organisations and we're determined uh, to do that. So there isn't wastage or duplication or, or, or unhelpful overlap and that process is underway uh, now. In relation to the South, again, we um, will be uh, uh, really hopeful for a very buoyant South and what that means is that we will want to support it. We will want, for example, SDI, we would still see supporting the South as it does high, and therefore there's no need to duplicate, you know, a, 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 you know, a foreign direct investment capability in, in the South of Scotland. They already have it in relation to SDI. So all of that has been worked through, um, but we want to be, you know, as supportive as we can be to make sure that the South can be all that it can be, and that's absolutely what we'll do over the next uh, year or so. And on the cost side, is there any discussion in terms of how um, the overall cost of setting up and running the enterprise agencies across the board can be um, can be managed. Yeah, um, uh, we will. You know, cost and value for money will be the heart of everything that we do. So where we can share, we will. Where we we don't need to, you know, copy, then we'll eliminate that. So so I. I so far, the discussions have been extremely positive, uh, and therefore, you know, none of us will want to waste resource uh, in either setting this up or, or to continue that. So that will be at the forefront of our mind. Good, thank you. Um, and very quickly, convener, it, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but your business plan seems to suggest a move away from using the term growth sectors, and you're now using the terms opportunities. Um, does this signal a shift? Um, or am I just reading too much in a change of words? Um, I th well, Linda can speak to this, but I, I, for me, um, we've been accused of being too narrowly focused on sectors, and when computer says, uh, the computer can say no sometimes to opportunities that folks consider could uh, pass us by. So for me, uh, sectors will remain important, but we absolutely must be open to opportunities, and we will flex our capability and resources to respond to those opportunities. So that's a shift, probably. That's good. So if I, can I can add, we're, we're, we're doing both actually. So um, sectors will continue to be important to Scotland's economy. And if you go and, for example, meet with an aerospace company, they'll recognise that they're part of the aerospace sector. And it's really important that we understand as a national agency in terms of what's going on in those sectors, what the supply chains are and how we can support them and, and all of those kind of things. But what we've recognised over the last couple of years is that's fine, but the world doesn't live in buckets like that. So some of the things, the capability, going back to manufacturing or the digital piece or the transition to low carbon economy, those opportunities cross sectors. And what we've tried to kind of ride both is a saying, so we need to understand what we need to do to respond to those global opportunities around those things, but then apply that and support those industries to respond to it. So we're doing both. So we're continuing to work with industry leadership groups. We're continuing to look at what that looks like. And we're, we will be participating in the Scottish Government review that they're doing this year around sectors. Because the other thing we want to understand is all our learning that, that we've got and any further learning um, in terms of particularly productivity in high employing, lower productivity sectors, how do you apply that into things like the care sector or other things? And what could we do in that area? So we're doing both, if that, if that helps. It does. Thank you, convener. Perhaps a final question then, um, and your answer may be that the world doesn't live in buckets like this either, but in terms of conditionality and putting conditions on business support to achieve specific goals, such as bring more disabled people into employment <coughs> or whatever the specific goal may be, what do you think of the usefulness of conditionality? Uh, I mean, I think the... I think the development around RSA, I think, is helpful. I think the evidence uh, for us is that the businesses we've supported so far um, have adopted, you know, the really positive practices that we've suggested in the, in, in the past. But I think RSA senses a different direction of travel in terms of being much more articulate around what we want back from our, you know, for our public investment. So I, so you know, you'll see that, uh, you know, for our major grants on next year, there will be more uh, thought 
not given to what do we expect out in relation to you know to levels of conditionality. So we will we will drive that forward. We'll work with the business community. Um, I think we want to positively influence as best we can because that's when you get best results rather than using uh, sticks. But at, at some point, um, we will want to test whether an investment in one area uh, yields the kind of benefits that you would get from from you know some of those conditions versus investing in areas that that perhaps might find that more challenging. But it feels to us a, a big direction of travel that we would want to make sure is understood by business and we can support business to, to achieve those. Right. Um, anything to add, Linda? Well, well, really, just to kind of add, th this, is, this is complex stuff. And what we're trying to do is make sure we get best value for money for every pound we spend on the right things that we talked about. But also that we are at the vanguard of as a country, I don't mean Scottish Enterprise, we collectively are at the vanguard of trying to nudge things in a particular direction and particularly behaviours in terms of what we, we do and what we get from that. So it's about judging the time when it's right to be um, doing things and encouraging and cajoling and demonstrating evidence and kind of getting a group of companies particularly that can demonstrate the benefit of that. And then I think at a different point in time, you can think about conditionality. I think if you do that too early, it can switch lots of companies off. Uh, so I think it's about the balance, about what we do, how we do it, and the timing for that. Uh, and I think we're always really open to thinking, how do we make sure that, that we get that right and that we don't switch things off too early that's actually going to help us to be able to move forward around things that are actually quite important. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in today. Um, I'll suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session.